Where did you grow up, Matt? I grew up in Los Angeles. Wow, so you actually grew up here. You're not a transplant from somewhere. No, nah, no. Unfortunately, I was grew up. <laughs> I grew up in L.A. For, I'm sorry. Fortunately, or fortunately, fortunately, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, why do you think you're fortunate to have grown up here? Um, Los Angeles has a certain culture to it. Um, growing up watching, um, you know, movies uh, movies that take place in Los Angeles have a specific aesthetic. Movies like Live and Die in L.A. that I loved watching, Die Hard, these like hard-hitting 90s noirish films all took place in Los Angeles. So growing up being like a movie buff and then being able to like drive through downtown L.A., which has its own aesthetic and Los Angeles being such a flat city, just kind of like it, it, it's a different temperature when you're a child watching movies and then being able to like walk the streets where they took place. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, mean, I remember watching shows like Hunter. I know it's before your time, but that took place. It was like a detective show yeah. that took place here. And it, it really romanticized L.A. Yeah. In, in a lot of ways. So it's interesting for someone who actually saw it versus a transplant as I am. It's cool. Los Angeles is, um, it's not like New York because New York is a beautiful city aesthetically. It's got, it's a vertical city. Los Angeles is flat. It's just, it relies pretty much on its, sunrise and sunsets to look pretty. And when you capture it right, I think that the city could kind of, has this aesthetic that it can't be really captured any other way. It's hmm. interesting. So how did you get started in filmmaking aside from growing up in a town that, you know, this is the sort of the Mecca? Yeah, um, you know, ever since I was a kid, I just always knew there's something I wanted to do. Um, I had, uh, I grew up watching movies, loving movies, um, watching all types of films. My dad just, we, we were uh, kids and I have a younger brother, so he we would just go to Blockbuster and rent like 10 movies on a Friday, and then we'd stay in home and just watch movies all weekend. Um, so by the time I was like 12, 13, I'd watched all these great movies, including like The Sting, and you know, um, the grifters, all these great noirs that influenced me in character pieces in Chinatown. Um, so by the time I was like 13, 14, I knew that was what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, I went to college and, you know, I was really into literature and philosophy. I went to Pitzer College and graduated with a double major in philosophy and film. Um, and after I got out, um, I pretty much just did every job I could so I could take my spare time and write and just kind of create my own stuff, um, figure out the type of stories I wanted to tell, figure out the type of characters I wanted to write, type of movies I wanted to make. Um, I think I'm still figuring that out because I don't really have an answer yet, but um, that was kind of my first entry point into film. Were your parents supportive of you wanting to be a filmmaker or screenwriter? Yeah, very supportive. Yeah, in ways. I mean, they don't. They they uh, they're both really supportive of me, and they they uh, neither of them are in the film industry, but they love watching my movies. They love understanding what I'm doing. At least they try to understand as much as they can. So they've always been supportive. So how is it for someone that has seen, because you've grown up here? I don't know exactly where in LA, but you know, close enough to where you see that Hollywood sometimes isn't as glamorous as it's definitely portrayed. I mean, especially since the recession, it's, yeah. it's changed a little bit. Um, how is that seeing the, sort of the nitty gritty of, of this town versus coming from across the, the country with like stars in your eyes? <sighs> I mean, I admire the people that come from across the country with stars in their eyes. Um, I think it's a different way to look at making movies. Um, you know, uh, Growing up in Los Angeles, I, I, I had a lot of extended friends and family members, people that were in my life um, that have helped me along the way that were in the entertainment industry. So I, I've watched um, some people, you know, have wild success and some people have difficulties. Um, so, and uh, I think that kind of gave me a grasp on like how really competitive and how difficult making movies and telling stories and you know, this new form of um, narratives that we're making is, you know, it's, it's such a business in Los Angeles, such a business, pretty much Hollywood is just the biggest business in the United States. 
Uh, it doesn't really work the same way it does in Europe and Germany and France and London where their sense of business and their sense of cinema tends to drift a little bit more than Los Angeles. So growing up in Los Angeles had its advantages and disadvantages. I find that interesting you said um, seeing people that have had difficulties because I'm trying to think of any other industry, maybe sports, but the film industry is where someone can hypothetically go to rehab or something can happen and then years can go by and they can make a comeback and be yeah. embraced. I don't know if there's other industries that where that's possible. So I just think that's interesting that you said some people you've seen have wild success and others haven't, but the good part is even if you are sort of down for a while. If you make a great film, <laughs> it's all that matters, yeah, right? right? Films are one thing that lasts forever. And I think that's what's important. Um, we think about what movies are. Right. Um, was it Last Tango in Paris, Bartolucci? I think he talked about how his film got such a strong reaction that the Italian government, essentially, he had to leave. He, yeah. he had lost his voting right. All these different things happened. And so he felt so shunned by like his own people and he traveled and he said actually that was a great experience because mm -hmm. he was able to see you know, other cultures he wouldn't have ever seen. Have you ever thought about what if you make a film at, at some point where it's got such wild success, but with that is going to come detractors and how, how that would, the sense of either responsibility or, or have you ever thought about that? Because we're in this new time now where yeah. all it takes is a group of people to have an opinion about something and it can just really affect one person. I mean, I think that's been a, a consequence and a casualty of all a lot of great filmmakers. You know, you look at Samuel Fuller, you look at Orson Welles, you look at Bertolucci, you look at Scorsese, Brian De Palma, Coppola, Godard, uh, Antonioni. Nobody liked Antonioni's movies when he was making them. Um, Bergman, same thing. Um, so you look at the great filmmakers, they had a vision and they kept painting this vision over and over again and it wasn't always well, well received. Um, so it's something I think that not my just myself, but I think all filmmakers and artists, like it's what keeps us making movies because we are like at some point terrified of the outcome of each of our movies. So you just want to keep making the next one. So I think is that part of it just being able to let go of the fact that there are going to be people that are going to react strongly in, in a negative or positive way and being just being because, you know, they say once an artist makes something or writes, it's yeah. not theirs anymore. That That sort of cliche. I think that you know, it's difficult because I think that art, whether you're painting, you're writing, you're a journalist, you're an author, you're a filmmaker, I think art, making art is being able to handle insensitive, sensitive topics insensitively, being able to be harsh and be a critic of your own work and the reality of the world that you live in. So I think for a lot of great artists, some of their work isn't well received because they have a harsh outlook onto the world or they have an understanding of human nature that doesn't always coincide with the moral order. Um, so I think that's something that's always resonated with like, if you're looking at even like Henry Miller, Charles Bukowski, great filmmakers, Bertolucci, you know, Orson Welles, they've all had these trials and tribulations because they're pushing the boundaries of what it means to be human in the world and their existence. Oh, beautifully put. What are some things that someone should know before becoming a filmmaker? Be strong, know what you want to say, take advice, don't always take it, and just go, make something great. At least try to every step of the way. Write something honest every day and do your best to put what you want to write on screen. When you say be strong, um, is that is that meant to, to resist criticism or, or can you expand on that, be strong? You know, you, you should always be able to, to take criticism as, a, as an artist. I think that's part of the job. But um, I think if you have an intent and a voice and you want to say something about, you're telling a story, you're telling a story about characters and why people do what they do. Um, so what I mean by be strong, I think that you stick to your principles and the theory and the thesis of your story um, and you hold on to that because you have to hold on to that for two years. You have to write a film, you got to raise the money, you got to shoot the movie, you got to edit the movie, you got to make sure this one idea 
is, conceptual, is conceptualized from the beginning to the end, throughout the entire process. Right, and then there's distribution, which is its own yeah. beast. Yeah. And that's a different side of filmmaking, the distribution. That's a totally different side. But just from advice to young filmmakers is just know what you want to say and do your best to hold on to that every day. What about in terms of being on set? Do you think you almost have to be a politician or is it better to be more behind the scenes because there's also a downside with being too much the nice guy because then you know someone could take advantage of you or yeah. they think, oh, I don't have to take this guy seriously. He's super cool. Don't worry, I can just do this, you know? Well, that's kind of what I mean by be strong is, um, you know, filmmaking is about managing egos, managing people, managing your story, managing your characters, managing a lot of things. And all of these things are happening at a rapid pace. You have to make decisions. As a director, you have to make a hundred decisions in a matter of a minute. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of politics that go involved. Um, you want to make sure that your actors are getting what they want because they understand the role. You want to make sure that your DP knows what he's doing. You want to make sure that your script is still the same. You can't lose sight of a lot of things that are playing place. So you it, you can't it, it's a difficult way to say you can't just be a dictator running your own set um there is there is some way there's there's a middle ground between you know the relationship that a filmmaker has with the people involved because at the end of the day um it's a collaboration it's a collaboration of multiple artists especially even when you come down to sound design and score by the time you finish a film you've got you know I think 80 people, 100 people working on it. You've got at least 12 incredible, hopefully ideally incredible artists that are putting their voice into your film. So being a director is about kind of curating all those voices and maintaining your own through, this, through the entire process. Have you had a moment in your life where you say, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life? Or, or you've never really had to have sort of this, you know, moment where there's light beaming down on you and you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, is it just been something you've gone from one film to the next or has there been something where this like voice has come to you and said, I've got to do this for the rest of my life and you were meant to do this? No, it's every day I wake up every day and I have a voice telling me, you have to do this for the rest of your life. Every day I wake up and every night I go to sleep thinking that same thing. Is that your voice? Yeah, yeah. Is it because you've had other jobs where you know like, this is what I want to do. I want to be able to love what I do, even if it gets hard and there's difficult people involved. Yeah, you know, I've had other jobs. I've, you know, I've done a lot of jobs. I've done a lot of jobs in film. I think I've done pretty work, pretty much worked every position on a film set you can. Um, but there's something about being in love with your craft that you can never take away from yourself and you can never deny. So like there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty being a filmmaker. Um, you know, my mentor, Robert Ferretti, he's made every film since Tango and Cash to Die Hard to Rocky. You know, I'll call him and I'll be terrified and I'll say, Bobby, you know, I, I'm like on the edge of my seat. I don't know what I'm doing in my life. I just want to make movies. And he says, get with it, dude. I, I live with the same thing every day, right? Which is you don't know when your next movie is going to come. You don't know if you're going to be wildly successful. You don't know if your movie is going to be good you know, you kind of make each film like it might be your last one because you've got to love it like that. So I think, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that at, at any point in your career, you're kind of always faced with those, that reality and those challenges, which is like, you don't just do it because it's the only thing that's there. It's the only thing you want to do. The only thing you can do. That's why I make movies. I think that's why great filmmakers make movies is because they don't really have another choice, you know. Right. So how was that for you to hear it from someone that has so many great titles under their belt, so to speak, that they live with that same sort of anxiety? Um, it's refreshing. It's good. You know, it, it, it makes me understand a little bit more that I think that that's kind of the, the world that we've all, you know, it's like having your own social contract with yourself. It's like you signed a contract saying, I'm going to live the life of being a filmmaker where you're trying your hardest to make movies every day and there are no guarantees. You think that's what makes it so enticing, aside from like 
the creative aspect and, and seeing this thing come together, um, the fact that it, it's not that guaranteed, and then when it does work. It's magic. Yeah, I think that is what's so enticing about it. There's a lot of moments of magic in making a film. There's that moment of magic when you're writing a script and you've stared at the screen for 10 hours, you can't figure out what you want this character to say, and you've been typing words for hours and hours and hours, and typing in circles, and finally you crack it with just one line of dialogue, and then you're off. You know, and it's the same moment where you're working, you're working, and working, and then finally you get a little bit of money, and then you're off, and you're making a movie. And then there's that moment when you step on set, and you set up your lights, and you're blocking your scene with your actors, and then you see the scene the way you want to shoot it, and it just flows, and you just capture this perfect scene, and you could have never shot less city, you could have never planned it, it just happened. And that's cinema. That's making movies. What would you say is in the time span of you actually making films? Like, what would you say your current career length has been? Um, I mean, I think I've been making movies since I was a kid, as long as I can remember. I haven't been always on set, but I've been making movies in my mind. I've been writing stories and writing characters. So as far as long as I can remember, I'm 33. So since I was six, I've been making movies, just haven't been actually shooting them and making them. So that's how long my career has been, I'd say. Okay. Have you ever wanted to stop? If I wanted to stop, I don't think I've ever wanted to stop. There's just been times when something's gotten rough or something's been challenging, but you, you always knew. Yeah, you always know that you always come back to the thing you love. You know, there's, and that's, that's filmmaking. Because I've, I've heard of other filmmakers back in the day, and I'm sure current ones that we don't even know of yet, but let's just talk about like, let's say the McCarthy era or whatever, yeah. where people, their careers were, you know, just totally destroyed, their lives were destroyed, and then somehow they were able to come back to being creative, but, you know, I mean, we live in some interesting times right now, hopefully that doesn't happen to this era of filmmakers, but, so there's been nothing where it's totally derailed you at this point, where you said, I want to stop, you no, just, nothing's mm -hmm. totally derailed me. No, I mean, you, you, I think that for myself, I mean, I've, I, I think it's just normal for all filmmakers to like, yeah, there's no, no, there's no guarantees in making movies. There's no guarantees in the film industry. So, you know, you're, you're always kind of at odds and you're always at, up against a time, you know, you're always up against a ticking clock because you've got to make something. You always want to make something. You know, it's, it's the only art that it's not like painting painting it's photography and paint you paint in your apartment by yourself photography and walk out and take photos filmmaking requires actors sound you know cameramen dp you know every single crew you, you requires people to make it so you're kind of always at this odd that you you you, you can't just make it by yourself so that's always like kind of a struggle as being a filmmaker is because you want to create all, at all the, t all the time, but you're not always able to. How much of you being a screenwriter is about the love of writing versus the love of writing so that a movie can be made from it? I mean, is it something that is painstaking for you to, to sit mm -hmm. and, and 10 hours may go by and you won't think of a line of dialogue? Or is it something that you love the process as hard as it is or you love it because it produces a movie? That's interesting. Um, both. You know, I love the writing process. I really do. Um, and um, I love being able to paint pictures with words. I love writing a story. I love being able to tell a story over three acts or two acts. And, you know, you could write a two-act film. And you could write these great characters. So you, I love writing. Writing is, like, such a passion for me. But it's also because, you know, if you want to say something, there's not a better person to say it than yourself. So as a director, um, sometimes you just, you're forced to write your own words because you want to get your vision on screen. So it's, it's never really come down to me trying to create a product. That's not what screenwriting is for me, to create a product to go make a movie. So that's not really my intention as a screenwriter, but it's always about me telling the story I want to tell. Um, and I've co-written stuff with buddies and friends and other great writers, but I, I really like, 
at times just you know being able to say what you want to say as a director what you want to put on screen um but doesn't mean i don't want to direct other people's words because i think that's just as valuable um but as a necessity as a, as a writer director it's because you have a vision that you want to write that's in your mind someplace that's in the back of your head and you can tap like these beautiful places and tell these beautiful characters are scary characters. Um, and it's easy to translate it from your brain to your fingers to the screen. Okay, it's interesting. So it's, it's about getting out what you want to say, not having this thing where, look, this is a movie and a screening in this festival. It's, it's this burning desire to like make a statement about something. Yeah, yeah. Have you always been like that, even as a kid? I, you should ask my parents, they'll probably say yes. <laughs> I've always been the, the one that wants to scream really loud, so. Uh -huh. Well, you know, so certain kids are more sort of precocious and they have a statement they want to, you know, proclaim to the world, and then others were the sort of the quiet ones, so I just wasn't sure. No, I was the first one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was hands down the first one. <laughs> What's your process for developing an idea? Oh, that's difficult. Um... Like, what are you doing before you write the screenplay? Well, I, I'll come up with an idea, right? Or I'll come up with a character, or I'll come up with a theory. Um, and most of the time for me, it's like, it's a thesis, it's something, and I think that might be because I, I, I read, I, I love to read so much literature and I, and I kind of come from philosophy that I, I develop a thesis or something that I want to say. Um, and then I find characters that I think I that can embody that, purpose and that that can function in a story that kind of carries this idea throughout it um, so I can communicate what I want to say in a story and through characters so always comes starts with an idea or a thesis or a theory that I want to talk about and the characters in the story kind of all fall in line from there um, then I'll just you know, kind of binge watch a bunch of movies that apply and I'll just write, you know, I carry a little notebook around me everywhere I go. So, cause I don't really type that much. I, I mean, I type, but I, I don't really write my script until I've written it, handwritten it a bunch of times in a bunch of different ways. And I've kind of flushed out my characters and that only then do I write the plot. Um, because I think that at least in, right now in the stories that I'm trying to tell, it's the characters motivate the plot rather than the plot motivating the characters. So I want to really know my characters like they're friends of mine, like they're my best friends, my childhood friends. And so once I know them, I kind of know the world. Once I know the world, I know the story. So that's my process. Interesting. Do you ever get lonely when you finish writing something because they were like your your best friend almost? Because you, you've, in a sense, if it stops, you're almost losing them for a little bit. Yeah, I haven't really thought about it like that. You know, you kind of, you kind of, after you finish a film or you finish a script, you're kind of like, oh, what now, you know? What do I do now? Because you're like spent this like three month period of time every day thinking about these characters, thinking about writing and thinking about what's next, thinking about how they would say this, thinking about how they say that. So yeah, when it's done, you're kind of like, oh man, I, I don't want it to be over yet, you know? And I think it's the same thing when you finish a film, you're like, oh, oh my God, done shooting? Like, that's it? It happened so quickly. So that's why you got to get into editing so you can keep it alive somehow. And then by the time you're done, you've got this file that's like 120 gigabytes and it took you a year and a half to fucking make it. And you're like, year and a half of my life turns into a 120 gigabyte file or a DVD. So it's kind of a weird sensation that you have when you're like, all this boiled down to this little thing that you can double click and it plays. And you just put it in the DVD player and it plays. But I think that's kind of what the whole process is. It justifies, it justifies, you know, the characters that you want to write is because they do get to play. They do get to be, on a big screen. They do get to go someplace and other people can watch and live and experience it for like the two hours. So although like when you're done with the script, 
it's kind of over. It's not really over because your audience gets to live through them. Your audience gets to view it. And that's like the second reincarnation of your film is like having other people be touched by what you've made. You said you like to read. You know, it seems like the novelist is sort of a lost art almost. You know, you think about like Sal Bellow or Philip Roth or Norman Mailer, like during the, the 60s, 70s, like those were the rock stars, sort yeah. of these, these provocateurs. And now it seems like so much has been because it's the, the, the moving image. But do you still enjoy, uh, you know, like fiction or what are you reading to sort of stimulate your mind? Yeah, I do. I, I read, um, I still enjoy a lot of fiction. I read you know, everybody from, yeah, I mean, my bookshelf is right there. <laughs> so, I mean, I've got, I read everybody from like Norman Mailer, Henry Miller, Charles Bukowski, you know, Ferdinand Celine, Jim Thompson, you know, everything, it's a wide range of, I read a lot of philosophy like Sartre and Baldriard and Virilio. So, it, it, when I'm not writing, I'm reading. And when I'm not reading, I'm writing. So, I'm, but I do think it's a lost art, and I wish it wasn't. Right, yeah. Because yeah. I always wish, you know, I, I try to even read some of my favorite s screenplays. You know, I, I wish that those were published. I mean, I have Paul Schrader's book that has Taxi Driver and Light Sleeper and American Gigolo, and I think those are incredible pieces of literature. They're just in screenplay format. So it's just a different language that has adapted now because the novelist is kind of dead, you know, in a way. I mean, I wish it wasn't, you know, Murakami's still great. I love Murakami. So there's, there's a lot of great authors still writing now. And it's interesting, too, how those writers at the time, I'm thinking of like Philip Roth, like he wrote, you know, about this young man growing up in the suburbs and certain things, and it was so offensive to certain people that you know, just, just today, by today's standards, it would be so tame. Yeah. But, I mean, some of those people, it drastically changed their lives. So much so, I think he moved to Connecticut to get away from some of the, the hype. But now, it almost seems with, with filmmaking, the shock value, you want to up it. Because then, I don't, I don't know, it's just interesting. that Like, I wish novel writing would come back in terms of the love of it and generations would want to get lost in a book. I do, too. I really do. Yeah. There's, there's something that's so beautiful about a novel. It's holding something in your hand. It's reading, it's words, it's prose. It's, you know, it's, it's just, I don't think there's anything else like it. It's a very intimate way of being with a story. Yeah. Whereas a movie, it's great, and I, I love watching a film in the theater with other people and taking it in and see where they laugh, see where they kind of get uncomfortable. But reading is, is such an intimate so, I mean, you can really get lost in a book. We well, don't read a book in a room with a hundred other people with the lights off. That's how you watch a movie, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> which is a little, you know, it's a, you know, it's a sociological thing that all these people go into one dark room and watch a screen and nobody talks and they all experience the same thing at the same time differently. And then they, the lights come on and that time's over and they walk out and talk about it. Sure. But they all experience this one hour and 30 to two hour period of time where they're alone in their chair, separated from others, experience something by themselves, the same way that you kind of read, but in this way, you're, there's a start and a stop to it, and that's it, and you're with other people. What is it about Charles Bukowski that you're so attracted to? I mean, in fact, we're not too far from where he lives and worked at the post office, right? Yeah. So what, what is it about him that, because he had a quite rocky life for many years until he had this one patron, I believe, that took care of him. Yeah, you know, I love, you know, I, I just think he, he, he's, uh, he's a new novelist. He's great. He, he had this sense of humor to him. He had this, like, punk rock sensibility. He just wanted to do whatever he wanted. He believed in freedom in a different way. He's kind of like, you know, uh, he, and he had this starch criticism of the world. And that always came out in his work, you know. The postal service and yeah. his job and his boss and yeah. I mean, he didn't live a happy life. He was an alcoholic and he, you know, but right. He wrote great books. That's true. I mean, even even I think when he found success, even after this patron, you know, and he, he found success, I think it was still, he was still the, those inner demons. But then they play out so beautifully on the page. Yeah, or, and that's that's the real like. 
people want to create this great work, but I think with it comes a little bit of a price. Yeah. You know, and I think people could idolize him and don't know if they would totally want to be him, but but you, so you you admire him. That's interesting because he's not really he's not even of my generation. He's for the generation before me. So. Yeah, I, I I love his work. He's one of you know many authors that I love, but uh, he's got that ability to throw daggers at the way the world is a little bit, kind of like Hunter S. Thompson. They both have this like particular viewpoint that only they have. Sure. And I, I think it's the same way when you watch, you know, filmmaker by a great movie by a great filmmakers. You're watching their view, their vision. So I think some. The great novelists of the 70s had that vision and it came through in their work. Did you make any short films before you made your first features at Wild and Blue? Yeah, I made a couple short films. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Now, were these ones where you actually had a crew or were these just more just on your own with some friends or like the short film level? Um, you know, one was, they were all pretty indie. I mean, like one was like just me and a camera and a couple of actors. Um, one was like some of my buddies from college students, like just the closest, well, you know, it was a crew, it was a college crew. Um, so those are a couple short films that I made. Nothing like big or expansive, but just a little fun, little shorts. And with Wild and Blue, did you plan to make it a feature or were you going to have it as a short and then it just evolved? No, I uh, I planned to make it as a feature the whole you know the whole time. Oh, yeah, it was written as a feature, got directed as a feature, came out as a feature. What's it about? <laughs> uh, Wild and Blues, you know, it's about a lot of things, um, but it's um, it's kind of this psychological thrill. It's about a guy who's uh, a serial killer who's making his own movie. That's kind of the log line but it's about a lot more than that. It's about like the reality of cinema, the reality about playing a part, what the camera does to people, how you see through a camera, the influence of movies onto people, how this guy's been influenced by movies. So it's really about cinema, um, kind of told through the serial killer's point of view. It's kind of like influenced by Man Bites Dog and some Michael Haneke films along the way. So that's Wild and Blue. And um, how many shooting days was it? Wild and Blue was 16 shooting days, hmm. yeah. So how was that for you to go from making two shorts to now you're making this very, it sounds like a very complicated story. It's, it's not like a simple, that sounds no. like a very complex. It was, yeah. Um, it was fun. I mean, it, it, you know, it kind of just, um, it moved really fast. Like, you know, I wrote a script. I, I met a guy, his name was Felix. He wanted to make a movie. Um, we buddied up. We kind of... You know, I wrote the script, we worked on it. Next thing I knew, I was on set. Wow. And um, it was there, you know, you just like suddenly you're there making a movie. Because um, we just were like, hey, we don't have a lot of money. We don't really, we're just going to put it together and we're going to, here's a date. And then we're just going to do everything we can to make the movie by this date and you know luckily all the pieces aligned along the way i mean a lot of things fell apart but you know everything wound up that date happened and we were making the movie you know we had a red we had a sound guy you had the actors you're making a movie so that's kind of all you need at a point you got dp you got a camera you got lights you got actors you got a script great shoot it that's kind of what happened so you didn't overthink it and it wasn't where you had to make it perfect. I mean, I haven't no, seen no, it, I so overthought like, oh, it. Oh, I had to make it, it perfect for sure <laughs> because that was my first film, and you know, I think you overthink and try to make everything perfect whenever you're making a movie. But like that, that was um, that was a fun experience because it was my first movie um, that I have obviously ever directed, first real film. And then when it when it was done, did you say I want to do this again, or did you need? You were like, well, that was terrifying. It actually came through. Should I do this again? Like, what was that experience like once it f was finished? It was a little bit of both. You know, you're kind of like, you know, you're, you're left with, oh, wait, did I enjoy every moment the way I should have enjoyed it? Did I write the best script that I could have? Oh, I did all these things wrong. Oh, I did this thing right. Oh, I can't believe I've done it. Oh my God, I waited my whole life to do that and it happened and now it's done. It might not ever happen again. 
you know, oh my God. I, so you're, it's, kind of, it's a lot of like, what did I just do? And it's over now. Um, and then you watch it and you're kind of like, wow, I made that. So that's this gratifying experience. So as soon as I wrapped Wild and Blue, I mean, I just jumped into editing it because I cut it myself. Uh, I like cutting all my movies. Um, Why? Is, it, what, is that aside from saving money and, and having more? No, time? actually, it's nothing to do with saving money. I, I just, I came from editing. It's where I kind of, I learned some of my best tools. Um, I love editing. I like other people's eyes on my work, but I, I like being intimate with it. Um, so I trust myself in the editing room. And that's really it. And uh, it's kind of like writing. It's, you know, Godard says you make a movie three times, you write it, you shoot it, and you edit it. That's how many times you write a movie. So it's just like writing. So the same way you treat writing a screenplay, you stay up all night, you figure out what you want to write, and you just keep typing the words out until it makes sense. Same thing with editing is you just sit there over and over and you keep cutting and you undo and you throw it away and you retart the scene and you cut again and that doesn't work and you keep going and you keep going and you get the rhythm and you get the vibe and you figure it out. Um, so it's just as intimate as writing is and sometimes the post-production process gets overlooked that way. But I think it's a really intimate side of filmmaking and I plan on always editing my movies. Um, I love doing that. Do you ever get in the editing bay or in, in your office in front of your computer and go, I didn't get the shots I wanted and have that like terrifying moment? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not, it, you, you're kind of always like, eh, I wish, I kind of wish I did this a little differently. It's not always about the shots. You're kind of like, oh, that would have been nice. You know, I'm pretty good with when I leave before I move on, knowing I got everything I wanted, but you're always kind of like, oh, well, this would have been a good idea, you know? Sure. You're kind of like, oh, same way, like, like, oh, I wish I had that line of dialogue. But then you're in post, so you can always ADR stuff and have fun and play around with it. And you got to watch the scene every way you can. You got to cut it backwards, forwards. I watch every scene silent, no music, no sound, everything, just because you got to see the way the scene plays out. Um, so you kind of, you kind of left it sometimes. You're like, I, I do wish I had this one little piece of dialogue or I had this one shot or it just happens. And just being okay with that and say, well, we're going to keep going because yeah, I mean, you're going to be as okay with it as you can because that's what you've got. Your new script is your footage. Wow. So you got to live with it. So with the film Wild and Blue, did you get distribution for it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you did. Okay, so you went the full, like you took it through the entire process. Did you have a screening too? We, uh, we did have a screening. We screened in Madrid Film Festival, um, which went really well. Uh, and I won Best Director and my yeah. actor won Best Actor. We went to a couple other film festivals and yeah, it, it was it was good. It uh, went, you know, got distributed in Germany and a bunch of countries and, you know, it's on iTunes and Amazon, so. Very cool. Yeah. You learn a lot. You really learn a lot because like, um, you know, I learned a lot by doing, which you're kind of like, at the end of the day, you're like, oh, I don't know if I... Should have learned by doing it. She thought about this as I went along, you know, but sometimes it's not always the case. We just made the movie, got it out there, got as much press as we could. We luckily had, we, we did this crazy stunt. We got on the cover of Movie Maker magazine. Um, How'd you do that? That's really cool. We uh, made a fake offer on a billboard and told them that we were going to offer them 50 grand because, and we kept sending them like images that they weren't going to like until they said no so we then spun it around and said our movie was getting censored in los angeles and and it got all this press it was on like tmz and all this stuff so it was, it was like a funny little prank it just wanted press so i created this like big argument with the poster company um fake news before fake news was a thing yeah so. exactly mm -hmm. well i mean it was real news they really did reject me and they didn't want me to but i didn't really have the money to make the offer on the billboard but the plan was to get them to say, no, we won't use your poster anyway, so. So was it offensive, the poster? Oh, it was a little offensive. A little offensive, yeah. yeah. Interesting. What year was this? 
I think it was like, I think it was like 2016. Oh, that recent. Okay. Yeah, 2016 or 2015, 2015 maybe. Wow. Yeah. That's quite an experience for a first feature. That's quite a ride. Yeah, it got it got some good press. It was um, it got out there. You know, I love the movie. It's it's totally offbeat and weird, and we scored a whole punk album to it. And like, you know, I had a buddy and he wrote great music. And we said, look, I, I said I, I'm always I wrote the song listening to the Cramps and the Damned. So I said, let's just write a punk album and just put it to the movie. I've never heard, like, I just want a full punk soundtrack and put it in the film and it worked and it was so cool. And we just did a lot of, we had a lot of fun making that movie. We'll go back to your first feature, Wild and Blue. You had done two shorts previously. Where did you get the confidence to know that you could write it and then execute on it? I just, I, I saw it, like, I don't know if confidence is really what you have. I mean, you have confidence as a filmmaker for sure, but it's more like I, I just had a, a vision of what I wanted the movie to feel like and sound like and the characters to say. And if I was able to articulate that, then I felt confident in my abilities. So I just think it came through doing it for me. Um, and it's also like, you know, you, as a filmmaker, you have to own what you do, right? So if you, if you own your words and you own the material that you're making and you own, like you own up to it, right? Then I think that with that comes confidence, right? So you're willing to take the risks and make the movie that you want to make. It's scary, but it's, you, you have to be the cop to have confidence in order to do that. Where do you go for screenwriting guidance? Do you go to a book? Do you go to a website? Um, I mean, I, I, I've read Save the Cat. I've read other books and um, I read a lot of screenplays, you know. I've, I think I've read Taxi Driver's screenplay like probably 15 times, 20 times. So you just, you just read screenplays. Same way that like you watch movies to see how movies are done. You, you know, you read screenplays. Or, you know, I've broken down. I had a class in college that all you did was you, just, you broke down, you watched your favorite movies, you watched like Hitchcock's films and you broke down each act and each structure and you broke down the script and how it corresponds to the movie and the movie to your script and so you just keep breaking it down. You wanna see how they shot the scene, how they covered it, you watch the movie, you pause it, look at it, look at the shot, why did the shot go from a dolly to a wide and why did the wide go to the close up here and why is it a down angle, point it up, you know, and. Why do the shots exist the way that they do on screen? You know, just look at it. That, that, that was my education, as I just watched my favorite films. So your next film is showing this Friday, A Violent yeah. Man. Violent Man opens February 8th at uh, 10 cities across the US and LA it opens at Universal City Walk. And it stars a football player, uh, Thomas Q. Jones. Yeah. When did you start writing A Violent Man? You know, about like six to eight months after Wild and Blue came out. So it was like 2015 or 2016, yeah. Did you have Thomas in mind for the part or he came on later? No, I had a script that, that, that we'd written um, and I met Thomas and he and I just like buddied up and we became really good friends. Um, and I saw him act in, in a friend of mine's short film and he was phenomenal. So I showed him a script for Violent Man. I thought that was such a cool way to tell the story. Um, and he loved it. So we sat down, we kind of like tweaked the script, you know, adjusted it. And so once again, it was just a happy accident. I was on a set, something else that I was, you know, working on producing and I saw him act and he so good um, that I was like, dude, you got to be in my movie. So that was, that's just kind of how that happened. Wow. So you presented him with the script? Yeah. And how long did you wait for feedback from him? When <laughs> no, Thomas and I got into it pretty quickly. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we like, I think, uh, you know, he, he'd come over to my house every, you know, two or three times 
three or four times a week and we would just watch movies, go through the script, go through the scenes, uh, tweak it. So we, and it happened very quick. It was like, it was like July we had the script or June, the end of June, we, we had the script and by October we were shooting the movie. So Thomas and I were together like every day um, leading up to it. It was like we just, it was at the point where we were kind of like got the go and then just went. Were you pitching it to other people before you had even written it? Um, other actors? Yeah. No. No? No. What's it about? It's about a mixed martial artist who's a murder suspect. So it's kind of influenced by um, In a Lonely Place by Nicholas Ray starring Humphrey Bogart. It's one of my favorite films ever made, which is great noir. Um, and that's about a serial, I mean, a, that's about a screenwriter who might or might not have killed a journalist right. when she was doing an interview on him. So I, I always thought that this would be such a great way to contemporize it. Um, you know, telling it in, you know, an urban story um, in the MMA world and uh, using real MMA athletes. So we have Chuck Liddell, John Lewis, um, and those two were really fun to work with. John Lewis starred in it and he also produced it and helped do the fight choreography with me. And um, he was one of the original MMA fighters in like before UFC was even made, he was one of the first fighters um, that founded the UFC. And he then became Chuck Liddell's trainer. So we all, me, Thomas, John, and Chuck all kind of became really close buddies throughout the making of the film. So we just like, in making it, it was just such a contemporary way of telling that story. Um, it just kind of flowed really nicely. So once you finished the script, um, where else did you send it out to? Like, I, I realize you had Thomas, sounds like locked in, yeah. and wanted to do it. He's very passionate about it, but where else did you send out the script? We sent it out for a period of time. We kind of sent it out everywhere. We uh, sent it out to different sales companies and finance people. Um, we kind of piece peeled all of it together. Some passed, some didn't, some, some got on board. And it was one of, once again, a situation where it was like October 16th, we're shooting. Hell or high water, we're shooting. And we did. You get the camera, you get the actors, you get the script, you got the lights, DP, shooting a movie. So. Did you have representation send it out? No. So that's an interesting. What, what was your process? Are you just like getting an IMDb Pro account and, and looking up people's managers or how are you doing this? Oh, to, for actors? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a casting director. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were talking about sending it out to agents and finance companies. Um, yeah, we had a casting director. So they put, uh, we, we auditioned a lot of people throughout the process, um, especially for a lot of the like ancillary roles. Um, one of them was, we cast my buddy John Scarloff, who was fantastic, who was in another film that I produced, Queen of Hollywood Boulevard. And I loved him in that film, so I wanted to use him again in this. Um, this time now I'm directing him, the other time I was producing him. Um, but my casting director pulled in some great people. We auditioned a lot. The actress who played Thomas's girlfriend, Kalila, was another weird serendipitous thing. He was on a TV show and he happened to see, he was watching the TV show that he was on and he saw her name on the same name card, that on the same card at the end as his. Turned out they had gone to college together. They had known each other for 25 years. Then like two days later, he was walking through Hollywood, bumped into her How and we wild. were like doing this, we were casting, we were meeting all these women for these part, all of them were great. Tom said, no, Matt, you gotta meet Kalila. So I met with her and the two of them had so much chemistry and they had known each other for so long and there was like no obstacles to get behind like, oh, you know the inner workings of Thomas. They had been friends since they went to college at, you know, 15 years ago. So how do you kind of like find a better actress to play his girlfriend that knows him very well. So it's kind of like, it was like one of those perfect moments and she happens to be an incredible actress. Um, and not only did she like bring out the best in Thomas, he brought out the best in her and their two performances like shined. Very cool, wow, that's a really cool story. So 
he just saw her name on the slate and then he ran into her. Yeah, they just bumped it on the How street. Bizarre. And he, we were casting that part and he said, Matt, you gotta meet this girl and she's terrific and I'm telling you she's the one. I met with him. They, we met at this uh, restaurant in Hollywood and I just had them ad-lib a scene and they did. And I was like, why, you know, you don't even need a script for these two, you know? Sure. Uh -huh. I mean, we did use a script, but still it was just like, they're perfect. Where is the movie shot, the majority of it? Well, some of it's shot in this apartment, to be honest oh, with cool. you. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's a beautiful place, by the way. Thank you. Um, and the rest of it shot all over Los Angeles. We shot uh, soundstage in Anaheim. We shot downtown LA. We did this great fight scene under the first street bridge in downtown LA. We shot in North Hollywood at this gym that we found, you know, shot everywhere. Shot it in 16 days pretty much all nights, all in LA. Really all nights, does that lend to sort of the feel of the movie or just that's how it worked out? Um, you know, I mean, you're shooting in a lot of the obstacles where like you're shooting in open businesses, right? So if you're shooting in a bar, you don't have enough money to shut down the bar during work hours. So you just go in there, there your call time's 2.30 or 3 in the morning. So your shoot's from 3.30 in the morning till 3 p.m. until the bar opens, right? So you kind of got that window. Um, I also like shooting movies at night. I think it's just this, I mean, everybody is, is off, it's, it's fun. <laughs> I mean, it's a little crazy making, because I think we did like 12 days of nights or something like that, straight. Um, but it kind of worked out like that because of locations, actors, um, you know, it's nothing better than shooting true nights. If you're if a nighttime scene, you got to shoot true nights. Um, so it just was one of those things just happened the way it happened. A Violent Man is your second feature? Second feature. Easier or more difficult than the first one? Different. Different. Um, it was a different, totally, you know, it's the same set of skills. Um, still directing, acting, you know, dealing with backstory. It's the same set of skills, just different. Totally different subject matter. Um, I did fight scenes that I've never done. I, I never did action scenes or, you know, you know, a three round MMA under, you know, fight ring, you know, MMA fight. I've never done that. So I rehearsed a lot and shot a lot of prep and prepped a lot to get to that. So it's a very different process for me than like Wild and Blue was, but at the same time, it's still the same. It's just making something different. You have Denise Richards in the yeah. film? Yeah. How did you cast her? Offered her to the part. She <laughs> said yes. I mean, yeah. What does she play? What's her role? She plays uh, a journalist um, who winds up dead. She she interviews Ty Thomas's character uh, after he beats the local champ Chuck Liddell in a sparring match. So she goes to interview Thomas's character. Um, one thing leads to another. I'm not going to tell too much, but she winds up dead, um, and the story kind of follows. You know the consequences of like a man whose job is to be violent, who's perceived to the world as a violent man, because that's his job, that's what he's trained to be, that's who he is inside, and the world is telling him you are who you are, and he's defending himself because he doesn't believe that's who he is on the inside. And then he becomes self-destructive, and man, I'm not gonna give away too much, but it's a murder mystery fun thing. So looking, I don't know when the the film with Humphrey Bogart was. Was it in the 30s or when was that? I think it was made in like 50s. Oh, 50s, okay. Yeah. Do you think the world is, is I know we're, without getting too political, is, is has more become this way? Telling people who they are? Or, or it was more back then, especially if we're dealing with McCarthyism and things like that. I mean, do you think we've become more of a society of sort of like pointing fingers and saying this is who someone is w without totally knowing them or it was more so then? Well, I think we've always been that society um, because 
you know, it's America. That's what America is. Um, but I think now it's different because we live in such a technologically advanced culture where, you know, you can kind of define yourself on a way through social media and Facebook. So it's a different type of resonance in the way that people view you and the way that you can let other people see you than it was in the 50s. But, uh, but I think that there are certain social obstacles that, that certain people face now um, that different people faced in the 50s, you know. If you were a Jew in the 50s and you went to a communist meeting for the rest of your life, you were canned to communist by McCarthyism. Now it's a different, it's a different, you have a different enemy. You know, there's a different people looking at you in a different way. Sure. But there's a sort of a modern day McCarthyism in that you can point a finger and say, this person's this, and they're sort of branded as that. And they may not be that. But, but so are there, without, you know, anyway, I'm getting too political here, but... I was just wondering, because you, you say that people are saying that he's violent and this is who you are. And, um, you know, we're, we're sort of in that space right now. Yeah. Well, I, it, a violent man's more about, you know, people eventually sometimes become what their job is or people think that you are what your job is, you know, because his job is a fighter. So the rest of the world must perceive him as being violent when he's actually not a violent man. He's just... A man who made a mistake maybe maybe not but um, you know you're also the story is really about several violent men in a violent situation in a violent job I mean every character in the film faces the obstacles of violence internally and externally because that's their job that's the world that they live in that's the MMA world that's the universe that all these characters exist in it's cutthroat it's a business there's money involved Right. So that's where the tone of a violent man comes from, is because this one character's job is to be violent. So therefore, as far as the police are concerned, he must be a violent man. Did you study the, the real life backstories of a lot of MMA fighters or even boxers, um, just in terms of like how they grew up and maybe what prompted them to get into the sport? I did. I did study some. Um, Thomas and I brought a lot of his personal backstory to the character. Um, and some to the script and people that influenced him because I always think that it's really important when you work with actors for them to bring their own backstory for it to resonate with them so you have th their character connects a little bit more with the individual who's playing the character. What did you find with the backgrounds of a lot of these MMA fighters? Um, I found that a lot of them um, you know, some of them came from dysfunctional homes. Some of them really came, were bullied as a kid. Some of them were really like, just wanted to be tough because it's an insecurity. Um, but, you know, I think everybody's different. How has making this film, A Violent Man, changed your life? Um, it changed my life in a lot of ways, you know, um, I think every time you make a new movie, you, you evolve, you, you fall in love another time with your script, with the people involved, with the material. Um, I'm really proud of the movie. I made a very good friend out of it, Thomas, who's become like one of my best friends. Um, and I, you know, I think it changed my life because it's another it's another thing, it's another piece of my work that shows on screen that audiences can watch. And that's important. Why did you want to tell this story? I'm a big fan of noirs. I love film noir. I love film noir in literature. I love film noir in movies. I love Hitchcock's films. Um, and I wanted to make something that kind of talked about um, the politics in America the state of America, what it means to be violent, what it means to be guilty before you're guilty. Um, so that was kind of like the heart and soul of a violent man for me and for Thomas and for the people involved and the producers and everybody that wanted to tell the story. It was like a fun crime film noir mixed with a murder mystery. And I hadn't really seen genre bending done like that. So it plays, um Friday in LA and it opens in other cities you say? Yeah it opens in 
I think it's like Dallas, Austin, Philadelphia, Chicago, um, a bunch of cities. Great. Has it screened at any festivals? Have, have you gotten audience reactions? From yeah, we premiered at the Oldenburg Film Festival. And then we did our, we did our world premiere at Oldenburg Film Festival. We did our US premiere at Miami Film Festival. And then we screened at the Kew Gardens Film Festival in Queens. So we did those three and that was kind of it. Then we just let it go. Because sometimes when you love a film, you just gotta let it go. Sure. Has any MMA fighter or boxer or whatever reached out to you afterwards and just, I mean, I realize it hasn't had a broad release yet, but just saying they resonated with it or? No, I mean, it hasn't had, I mean, it's gotten very good critical reviews so far, um, but it, it hasn't had, uh, we haven't had that MMA guy come, you know. Sure. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> it's coming. <though>. Yeah. <laughs> what are some small habits that you try to do to make yourself a better filmmaker? Just watch movies, read, study movies. That's my job. Like if I'm not making movies, I'm studying them. If, uh, if I'm not writing, I'm trying to read something that will influence me to make a, be a better writer. Um, those are my habits. Watch a lot of movies, every kind of film. I notice with a lot of uh, young filmmakers that they're they're just total cinephiles. I mean, they just they know everything. Even some like bad movie that I hate to say you'd find on like a, a discount, yeah. you know, DVD bookshelf Those somewhere. Those are great too. I, they know them. Those are great, yeah. <laughs> They're like, yeah, oh yeah, I've seen that one. I yeah. actually like it. I like that one part where this happened, you know. Gotta love them all. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I've got a soft spot for like 90s weird thrillers and American type. It's, I love everything from French New Wave to Italian Neorealism to Japanese New Wave to Takashi Miike to, you know, all across the board, all genres. Um, I try to watch everything. Sure. It's, it's interesting how I think to see a younger generation fascinated by the 90s. Yeah. When you live through it or you were a young adult in it, it's like, ah, eh, well, yeah, there were some pluses and minuses. But what do you think it is? Because you were probably a, a child at that time. And so to see it through another set of eyes, maybe do you think it, it seemed more glamorous? No, I just, it, maybe it was a little, little glamour there being a kid watching movies um i just think they made these cool like weird thrillers back in the 90s i mean john Dahl made a lot of great films i watched um unforgettable the other night ray Liotta. um you know you just they make these like you know the grifters i watched stephen freers i mean they just make these it's kind of like this one period of time where they just made these kind of like Neo noirs, and that's it. That's it. You know, Wild at Heart. Wild at Heart. Yeah, David that was, Lynch. Mm -hmm. I love that. That film. was a great film. Yeah. I've watched Mulholland Drive probably like a hundred times. It's interesting too when these filmmakers now try to make these new sort of '90s. Yeah. Sort of versions with the with the synthesizer music and just make it seem like that, and it, it doesn't feel the same, but it. I think every generation, because I used to look at the 70s and think, wow, how cool. Yeah. I wish I could have, you know, when I was just a little kid. But Now you love John Carpenter and all his <laughs> films. I mean, he's awesome. You know, it's just, it's a different generation. So. Sure. What are your proudest accomplishments? In my life? Yeah. Um, I made a couple movies that I think are really cool. Um, I think the audience likes them as well. So I'm really proud of that. I have great friends. I got a wife I love. Those are accomplishments. That's pretty cool. Yeah. What do you love most about being a movie director? Um, yeah, I just like telling stories. Stories about characters. Stories about the world. Stories about stories i just love that feeling i love the feeling when you're on set you set up the lights you work out a scene you beat it out the actors get the flow you see the scene you can bring in the camera you can set up your shot and then suddenly you're like wow this is taking on a life of its own it's perfect don't touch a thing and i love it when you're in the editing room and you're in this sticky place and the singing's not really working and then you kind of get one little cut that 
makes sense and then you're off and then the scene kind of unfolds before you and you watch the whole thing and you're like wow i just made a movie made a scene that feels real and it's great you lay in some sound design some score and everything just flows what i notice about a lot of writers or artists filmmakers is that they'll see a stranger and they'll become fascinated by that person and they'll attribute some story some huge story to them yeah do, do you find yourself doing that whether it's just you're at Trader Joe's and you see someone, you're like, wow, that person's really interesting. I bet this, this, and this. Sometimes, sometimes I do that. Sometimes it's like, I get influenced by characters in movies sometimes. I'm like, oh, what if I took that character and put him in this, you know, in this circumstance and this happened to that character. Um, so it's people in real life, people that I know, people that I'm close to qualities and traits of myself or qualities and traits that I see in other people or whether it's a stranger off the street or it's things that I've wanted to do or things that I've heard a story about somebody told me something happened to someone else and I said wow that could play out like that you know you just get influenced by all of these things around you and you should just never limit the way a story can go even though you'd already made a feature what were some unexpected challenges that happened with the second film, A Violent Man. You know, I, I, it's the same things that happen on, on any film set, right? There's just, you know, you, you improv a scene, things change, the scene takes a different texture, your, your light's not right, you gotta wait, you have less time than you thought you would. Um, the unexpected challenge on A Violent Man you know, the fight scenes were difficult. The fight scenes were difficult to shoot. I mean, I prepped a lot and, and we shot, I mean, I shot like seven scenes of the film, but like with just like my buddies and co-producers and like Thomas and just, and I shot less of them all and then I shot them before I got on set intentionally so I could like work out what shots I would need, what shots I don't. So no matter how much you prep, right? And then I cut the scenes together and I was like, oh, you know, I really don't need this shot. I really don't need that or this one will play so I don't need to spend too much time on it. And so no matter how much you prep, right, like things will always change when you get on set to a degree. I mean, we prepped a lot and those scenes went as smoothly as possible. But, um, you know, it's, I was also telling, uh, I, I think that the one obstacle is telling so many stories at one time. Wild and Blue is a story of one guy and this was a story of one guy, cops, bad guys, this, that, and all the kind of storylines had to interweave and keep you on the edge of your seat at every time. Um, so that was an obstacle, but I think that it, it does well. I think the audience will be happy. Did you have like a fight coordinator? I did, his name was uh, John Lewis. He played one of Ty's best friends. His name's Jameson in the film. Oh, cool. Yeah, he's the, the actor in the movie. So it was just sort of the, the unexpected turns of you thought a scene would go this way and then once you saw it from the camera. Well, the fight coordinating, the fight, the fight coordinating was like pretty on point, you know, and the, and all of our shots were on point, but you know, your, t your actors get exhausted. You know, sure. I mean, you've got Thomas Jones, who like is running back pro of all time. You've got Chuck Liddell fight, you know, UFC Hall of Fame. So these guys are gonna go, they really are extremely athletic and they did not hold back on their athleticism at all through the fight scenes. So you're kind of on the edge of your seat like, oh my God, like we're doing this, is one of these guys are gonna get hurt and you'd say, and it looks so real because part of it is real, you know? And like, I'm on board to do that as long as my actor's on board. And they were, so it was like, kind of like every time you You'd say action, your heart would race up until you said cut, and then you'd, you'd still be pounding for like five or six seconds. You're like, you're okay, you're okay? You're really okay, you're really okay. And then they're like, yeah, yeah, let's, we're ready to go again. So for me, watching the fight scenes, I'm not like, I'm not a fighter. So I'm just, I'm just a director. I'm just trying to make the scene look as good as it can. So that was uh, just energizing every step of the way. Are you through the distribution phase with the film or there's another leg to it which is going to be online? No, it comes out theatrically and VOD the same day. So 
just like, I'm done. Yeah, I'm really excited. Are you already planning something else? My next film? Yeah, I got a couple things. I'm Very cool. Moving around now. So that's kind of, it seems like now this is becoming a pattern. One kind of ends and the other is starting and that's how you kind of see it going. Fuck on wood. Let's keep it that way. <laughs>